December 13th is St. Lucy's Day, and uh, as a little bit of calendar trivia, before the reform of the calendar in the 16th century, uh, in the Julian calendar, which was the previous calendar attributed to Julius Caesar, December 13th was the shortest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. Lucy day, Lucy night, shortest, longest, dark, and shortest light, something like that. It was a little ditty to help people remember that. And of course, Lucy, or Lucia, uh, means light. So uh, Lucy was a, a virgin martyr in southern Italy, in Naples, I think. And the legend of her martyrdom involved her eyes being put out and then miraculously uh, restored. So, of course, this is all connecting with the idea of the light going away as the days shorten and then miraculously, as it were, uh, returning. So uh, I won't uh, vouch for the historical accuracy of, of the St. Lucy legend, but it's, it's an important fact. And it also, of course, is a present in English literature. Um, so good, good thing to know. My text today is, however, from the gospel for today, chapter Matthew, uh, chapter 11, verse 7. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. What went ye out into the wilderness to see? Our collect and epistle today share the theme of clerical stewardship, what it means to speak of the clergy as ministers and stewards of the mystery, mysteries of God. Uh, in English, the word steward comes from two uh, old English words, uh, sty, as in a pig sty, and ward, or guard. So stewards are literally the pig keepers. And uh, it's something important for the clergy to remember about themselves, and in a sense, our, our role is modest to care for God's uh, people. Of course, it's a little less flattering even to the laity than uh, comparing them to sheep. Uh, but anyway, that, that is an important theme in today's collect and epistle. But I want to speak now more of the gospel, which concerns John the Baptist, our Lord's forerunner, and uh, at least in traditional Christian reckoning, the last of the line of prophets reaching from the Old Testament uh, up to John, whose task was, among other things, to prepare the way for the Messiah. In today's lesson, our Lord talks about John the Baptist, while in next week's gospel, John the Baptist bears witness to Christ. Of course, John the Baptist is himself a minister and steward of the mysteries of God, which connects these two themes. Specifically, John is the kind of minister called a prophet, and he was the greatest of the prophets, the one who ushered in the kingdom of heaven. The word prophet is composed of two Greek words, the uh, second part, the, the fet part, uh, comes from the Greek verb phemi, meaning to say or to speak. A prophet is someone who speaks. And then uh, you go to the first part of the word pro for his kind of speaking. And uh, pro in Greek, like English, the English word is for, English word for, can have multiple meanings. And these meanings relate to the three main functions of prophets. So the prophet is someone who speaks for someone else. The prophet is someone who speaks for God, who conveys to human beings God's message and God's teaching, God's warnings, and God's praise on occasion. So he speaks for someone else. He also speaks uh, in uh, for, F-O-R-E, he speaks beforehand. He, he foretells, as we would say in English. So he speaks in advance of events 
to explain what will be coming. And in the Old Testament, this is an important function, and it is the way in which the truth of a prophet's teaching can be tested. If what the prophet says is going to come about does come about, then he is a true prophet. If not, he is not. So he speaks for someone else, and he also foretells what will be coming. And finally, he is someone who tells forth or speaks forth the truth. That is, he is someone who speaks truth to power, as we say uh, nowadays. I must say, when someone tells me he's, he's being prophetic, um, I, I usually, I heard that a lot when I was a kid. What that usually meant was, I will uh, mimic the editorial page of the New York Times, and I'm being prophetic. So, no, you're not. You're, you're just conveying conventional wisdom. Uh, but to speak forth is to uh, tell the truth, usually when it is unpopular and will bring criticism. So John the Baptist is a prophet in all of these senses. He goes before one of the Herods and condemns Herod's marriage to his sister-in-law as incestuous. For this, as we know, he's thrown into prison and eventually is executed. In today's lesson at the beginning, he is speaking from prison. So we have that moment in time after his imprisonment before his execution. John also speaks for God at the beginning of his ministry when he calls the people to repent their sins and to be baptized. And finally, John foretells what will be in the future when he proclaims Christ as the Messiah, the one who will usher in the kingdom of heaven, who will surpass John and all the prophets of the Old Testament. Because a spokesman is ultimately less significant than the person for whom he speaks. John is a voice, but a voice that is talking about someone else. My text today refers to John's location, namely in the wilderness. At the actual moment of the lesson, as I've said, John is in the prison. We're told that in verse 2. But John's proper place is spoken of by Christ when he says that John is in the wilderness. What went ye out into the wilderness to see? Our lesson from chapter 11 of Matthew uh, uh, may think cause us to think back to chapter 3 when we were told that John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. So he is a man of the wilderness or of the desert. The wilderness is a place of many great things in the Bible. First, the wilderness is the place where Israel wandered for 40 years during the Exodus. The wilderness is the place where the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses were given. It is the place where Israel encountered God in cloud and majesty and awe. That wilderness was the place where God fed his people with manna with water from the rock. It is the place where he led his people by a pillar of fire and of cloud. The wilderness is the place where the slaves of Egypt became a nation, by no means perfect, but under God's eye and rule. In later history, the wilderness is the place where from time to time the prophets would flee to escape evil kings as when Elijah flees evil Ahab and Jezebel. When Americans used to find life intolerable, they would head west. When prophets felt that way, they headed towards the desert. The wilderness is where the prophet Isaiah foretold a voice that would come to proclaim the way of the Lord. The wilderness is where our Lord himself will go after his baptism to fast and to overcome the temptations of Satan. The same wilderness is where our Lord later feeds the people of God with miraculous bread from heaven. In all four Gospels, as you recall, he feeds 5,000 people in the wilderness, and in Matthew and Mark, he feeds 4,000, likewise, 
in the wilderness. So when in today's lesson, our Lord speaks of John's place in the wilderness, he is invoking all of this history, stretching back from the Exodus through the line of Israel's prophets, concluding with John's own biography, and then fulfilled by Christ himself in his temptations and ministry. The wilderness, to put the matter briefly, is where men and women, men and women encounter God. Why? Well, in the wilderness, the distractions of the city are banished. In the wilderness, the unnecessary is stripped away and the human heart is addressed by God. In the wilderness, the human body, at least in the Bible, is nourished by God. In the wilderness, God sends manna and water through Moses and later feeds Elijah before his journey to Sinai. God sends John the Baptist locusts and wild honeys. God's angels feed our Lord after his fast. Our Lord multiplies loaves and fishes to feed thousands. The wilderness is a place that seems barren, but the wilderness is the place where, with everything else stripped away, we are forced to rely on God, and God responds with his care. The heart of John's message to his audience was that we should look to him who was to come, to look to our Lord, to follow our Lord, to trust our Lord. You and I may not be in quite the same desert. We're not in the Sinai or the Negev. But I assure you that this world of ours, which has such plenty and such wealth, is also very much a wilderness, a place of danger, a place of hunger and thirsting after the word of God and the food of the Spirit, if not literal food. It is an irony that we only find the food we really need when we realize that we have a need, that there is a great hunger in our world and in ourselves that our world cannot supply. Our Lord asks, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? Perhaps a prophet? If so, hear the words of the prophet and follow the Lord who alone can lead us through this barren land in which we wander. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.